Well, the, the time on the clock has ticked round, and it's time to get underway again. Ashfield Baptist is live and back in business. Welcome, everybody. Great to see you all in person again after so many weeks of uh, seeing each other only through little square boxes on the streets. Uh, and uh, it's great to have the opportunity to worship God together, even though our service this morning is going to be a little bit different to what we would normally do when we meet together here. Just to run through a, a few of the rules, of course, um, distancing, we're okay today with the numbers in the church, we're able to uh, maintain those distances, and uh, I would ask you, Please to maintain those distances through the service and uh, throughout any conversations and activities that we may be involved with following the service. Please maintain that social distancing at all times. Stuart and Robin are our COVID safe experts and wardens, and we try and keep everybody in mind. Uh, Stuart's maintaining the watching group from up the back there this morning. Uh, in the event of anyone feeling unwell, please uh, leave immediately and notify Stuart um, on the way out um, so that we can advise on any further action that may be necessary. Unfortunately, as you'll probably be aware from what you've read in the media, we're not allowed to sing. We're not allowed to dance either, unfortunately, nor um, should we be standing up? We are actually going to have an exercise <laughs> break, yes, at one point, to give everyone the time to stretch their legs. But please, during the course of the service, remain seated and um, resist the temptation to sing along with the band, just do it quietly to yourselves and uh, not out loud. Um, we don't want to be spreading. Um, germs across one another this morning, so uh, that's part of the rules. There are a few other things in terms of um, what we have to do so we finish, um, but we'll deal with that when we come to the end of our gathering together. I want to welcome, there are some already who have joined us via Zoom. We've kept the Zoom option open. It doesn't look quite the same as uh, the Zooms we've been having in recent weeks, but we are on Zoom this morning, so welcome to you. Uh, the service will also be available on, online. Um, and for anyone who's watching either over Zoom or online who doesn't know, my name's Gordon, I'm one of the elders here, and I'm leading us through the service uh, this morning. So, uh, with that in mind, what I want to do at this stage is, is to open our reopened gathering in prayer and thanksgiving to God. So, let's pray together. Almighty God, Heavenly Father, we thank you that we can come back together and we can be in fellowship with one another in real time, in the real world today. We thank you for the technology that has enabled us to keep in touch with one another in recent times and for those who even today are using that technology to be part of this gathering. We're conscious, Lord, that these are very difficult times, not just for our country, but for the world. We are conscious that there are many people around the world who are suffering, who have lost loved ones, who are living in fear of how the pandemic may affect them, who have been lifted out of their personal comfort zones by what has been happening. Who are suffering anxiety, depression, concern for themselves, concern for others. Lord, we just want to lift this whole pandemic situation to you, Lord, this morning, and ask that in your mercy you will enable this situation to be resolved. We pray for the medical teams, not just in our own hospitals and uh, medical facilities here in Australia, but again, around our world, 
we pray for those who are laboring day by day, week by week, to ease pain and suffering. We just commit them to you. We commit the leaders of the world to you. That in the midst of this pandemic, justice and right might prevail. We pray against those who would seek to turn this situation to their personal advantage. We pray that our world may work together towards finding the solutions that we need, that we might be rid of this problem. So Lord, we commit this to you. We commit ourselves to you, both those in this building, those who are sharing in this service by Zoom, those who might see us online later. We pray for one another. We give you thanks for one another. But above all, Lord, we give you thanks for who you are. You are our great and our wonderful God. And in the midst of all this crisis, of, of all these issues, we pray, Lord, that we may never lose sight of you. We may trust you. Put our hand in your feet and walk with you through all the fears and uncertainties of life, trusting in your love, in your grace, and in your mercy. We pray these things in Jesus' precious name. Amen. The psalmist wrote in Psalm 48, Great is the Lord, and most worthy of praise. In the city of our God, in his holy mountain, it is beautiful in its loftiness. The joy of the whole earth is Mount Zion, the city of the great king. Walk about Zion, go around her, count her towers, consider well her ramparts, view her citadels, that you may tell of them to the next generation. For this God is our God forever and ever. He will be our God, even to the end. In these verses, the psalmist gives us a vision, a metaphor, an illustration of the greatness of our God. Eternal Father, creator of heaven and earth. Those verses also remind us that if we have a relationship with God through Jesus Christ, and we are building that relationship with him, through our prayers, through our studies of the scriptures, through fellowship with one another. He wants to develop that relationship so that he is able to guide us through all the issues of life, where he shows us his perfect will for us and helps us to grow our faith so that we can be obedient and follow him. We're going to have two songs from the band at this point. Again, as I said, please resist the temptation to get up and sing along and jump around. But we're going to have songs, How Great Is Our God, followed by 10,000 Reasons. <laughs>
within the next little while about what will happen at that meeting and uh, various processes in regards to the uh, constitutional change and different things that affect the decisions we'll be making at that meeting. So that will be that will be coming along. So be prepared for that. And we will be putting out as well, probably a little scale down uh, from previous years because of time constraints and pressures and technology and things, we will be putting out a more scale down version of an annual report. I'm conscious of the fact that uh, this is our first time back in one number of years. And um, I have a feeling that there are probably some of you who might want to share something. Um, because of uh, distancing and other constraints, you know, we're not going to actually pass microphones around. But we do have a microphone here that is untouched by anybody. Um, so if, if anyone does have something that they want to share, a prayer point, a raise point, please don't just come forward, uh, share it from here, and uh, go back to your place. Um, and then at the end of that, we'll pray for anything that um, people may be asking us to pray for. So, um, just, just take a minute and uh, anyone who an open invitation, anyone who wants to share something of either what has been happening in the last few weeks or prayer or praise, please come forward and share with us. Um, I just want to reflect on um, the fact that we're here today in the school form, but in the last three months or so we've been zooming in. I want to thank particularly Alan and Jenny and Alan and uh, everybody else who been here. Um, so, and we reconnect still with the Zoom family in wherever they are. That's great as well. So, we're actually, we've progressed beyond where we thought we would be three months ago. We now are back physically, but we're still connected with people who are here today. So, thank you very much for the input. That effort into the community Yeah, well, I guess to the op shop, we have been and yeah, so it's been nice to be available to the community and to be a blessing to everyone. And we've seen a lot of new customers come, which has been fantastic. Um, yeah, so that's really great. We would love more volunteers, so if anyone is available, it doesn't have to be every week or even for the whole day, we're nine to two. But um, there's potential that I may have to pick up extra shifts as a nurse and may not be available every Friday, which makes it hard for Robin and our other volunteers. So even if you're available for one or two hours, it would be great to miss out every now and then. Please see myself or Robin if you can nice. um, But the blessing box has been going well, and it is, I don't think it's been completely empty, which is a good sign that people aren't taking Willy-nilly, but taking regularly. There are some regular people that come that we've noticed, um, and they're very thankful whenever we see people. Um, we do need ongoing donations if you're able to give. Um, the other thing we still have to do is a letterbox drop to the community to sort of spread the word that way. Um, and we're probably getting to a point where we need to start reviewing it and thinking about how it's going and stuff. So it has been a really good thing to have. And um, yeah, and I guess we can just pray for the people that are coming, the people that are coming using the blessing box and the shop. We can remember to pray for our community at large. And um, I think, particularly the, the students and people that are away from home having to really struggle financially, we need to think of those in our prayers. Um, and people are very in various parts of our country and world. So thanks. Okay, well, I'll leave us in prayer in just a moment. Um, but in case anyone has <coughs> come on Zoom while we've been talking so far, um, I'm just going to reinforce the message that we sent out earlier. Please stay around at the end of the service because we want to put all the people who are on Zoom up on the screen through the miracle of the technology. I'm not quite sure how we're going to do that, but I don't understand these things, but I do. So um, um, we want to 
we'll see everybody who's joining us and we'll put them up on the big screen at the end. So please stick around. Let's just commit to God those things that we've just been sharing. Again, Almighty God, we just want to thank you for your blessings. Thank you that um, you have helped and supported George in these difficult times for the opportunities that have been given to him. Just praise you and bless your name for that. Ask that you will continue to watch over him and for the whole family, Lord. We're just so conscious of all that they do for you. And uh, we just want to lift them up and pray for them this morning, Lord. And as we pray for the narrator, we also pray for Robin and the others who work at the op shop, the opportunities in community engagement. And we're reminded, Lord, that just because we're back in this church today and things may look a little bit more like normality for us, for a lot of people in this world at the moment, things are still very far from normal. And so we commend to you the ministry of the Blessing Box and other community engagement activities, other means by which we can reach out over a longer period of time into this community of Asheville. And in your name, deliver hope, mercy, sustenance and support. Lord, we just want to commit all these things to you. We, we thank you that these efforts are going on week by week. We're doing it individually. We forget all of these things. Not just in, in the name of this church, but in the name of Jesus. And in the name of the that you give us. So we commit these things to you. We commit one another against you. Amen. Uh, now, uh, we're going to have our scripture reading this morning, which Beverly is going to bring us, and immediately following that, Peter will come and bring the message from God's word. Today's Father reading is from the book of Mark, chapter 1, beginning of verse 1. The beginning of the good news of Jesus Christ, the Son of God, as it is written in the prophet Isaiah. See, I am sending my messenger ahead of you who will prepare your way. The voice of one crying out in the wilderness, prepare the way of the Lord, make his paths straight. John the baptized for the feared in the wilderness, proclaiming a baptism of repentance for the forgiveness of sins. And the people from the whole Judean countryside and all the people of Jerusalem were going out to him and were baptized by him in the river Jordan, confessing their sins. Now John was clothed with camel's hair, with the lead belt around his waist, and he ate locusts and wild honey. He proclaimed, the one who is more powerful than I is coming after me. I'm not worthy to stoop down and untie the thong of his sandals. I have baptized you with water, but he will baptize you with the Holy Spirit. Good morning. And all the people who are in the building, do you feel like standing? I haven't you to stand up and get the blood flow. You people are there once you can zoom and you cut the arms here and so forth. You make your own way. We're going to stand here and look around and wave at somebody. Point at the person who owes your money, whatever you need to do. When you sit in the front row, you've got no idea what's happening behind you. You could have gone there, but you're here, so that's fine. Yes, you can do that. You can jump. You can... Oh, that felt better, doesn't it? Just. Thanks. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Oh, standing up and preaching two things at once is a challenge. <laughs> we are considering wilderness, a desert place, wilderness, separation from familiar supports, freedom from persistent demands. Wilderness can come in various guises. And it can be a deliberate time of solitude that you've chosen to set aside. Or it may be the result of circumstances. It may feel like wasted time or waiting time. But it can be, as we're saying over these two weeks, it can be 
the place where we meet God and where we encounter our true self. So last week we had a little look at the, the place where we meet God, refining, renewing, even wrestling. And uh, touched on the wilderness episodes in the life of the nation of Israel. Today we turn to the New Testament. And we've heard the prologue of Mark's Gospel just read to us. We could even stay and study the context and meaning of wilderness in that passage. The prophetic word from Isaiah, a voice quite calling in the wilderness. Interesting, I, as I read different translations, some say the voice calling in the wilderness, and some say the voice calling in the wilderness prepared. So that depends where you put the in the wilderness Christ. Uh, we hear the introduction of John the Baptist, situated in the wilderness, ministry, baptizing in the wilderness. The wilderness in the tradition and history of the people is the place for turning to God, for returning through repentance to the original relationship with the Lord. John's ministry attracts not only the people into the wilderness, but Jesus himself is drawn and he's baptized there. And a little bit later it says in that chapter he was in the desert for 40 days being tempted by Satan. We're going to be having a look at that passage particularly. <clears throat> so again, our two-part theme, the wilderness, that place where we meet God, that place where we encounter our true self. Who do you think you are? It's a TV series. It's been going for a while. It's still going. Uh, it, I think it originated in the UK, where it covered characters like Bill Huddy from The Goodies, David Suchet from Poirot, Stephen Fry, he's in everything, Nigella Lawson, she's in the fridge. We have an Australian version, and if you haven't caught up with it, the format is that a team follows that, that character, lead character, who seeks out their background in history, and they usually encounter some surprises along the way. When I was reading about it, I read that Michael Parkinson is reported as saying the team discontinued his project after six weeks because they couldn't find anything interesting. <laughs> I know, that sounds a bit profitable to me. Michael makes everybody else sound interesting. He has a gift. Uh, so who do you think you are after that, con that context? Because in the temptation passages of Luke 4, and I'm not going to read Luke 4, you might remember it, but I will make reference to it. Jesus faces the temptations of the enemy. And there seems to be a who do you think you are preface to the temptations, at least in two of the three. So just to remind you of the narrative, Jesus, it says, full of the Holy Spirit, is led by that Spirit into the desert. He goes without food for 40 days. And the temptations seem to have occurred then at the close of this period when his resistance was at its lowest. And his hunger was at its greatest. We're going to follow the sequence in Luke 4. If you want to turn to it, or if you remember it, but I'll be making reference to it. Fairly simple. There are temptations and there are responses. If you are the Son of God. And that's how the first one begins, as the tempter challenges Jesus. And there is, there is a who do you think you are question in that. The question, however, is not to suggest that Jesus was other than the Son of God. I don't think the tempter knew that Jesus was the Son of God. I don't think it's even to suggest that he was not the Messiah. I think the question and the temptations are asking, what kind of Messiah? Who do you think you are? Among our moves, and we've done a few, uh, we were in Canberra, we ministered at Church of Dixon, lived in the manse at Hackett. And uh, before we got there, an energetic team had removed a lot of the growth from the backyard of the mess. But no, back up. We picked up on the momentum and we thinned out some vines and creepers overgrowing the carpool. Gardening, we talked a bit about gardening over these weeks. It's not just preparation and planting, it can often be the process of removing the vigorous but unwanted growth to create space and light for the desired growth. Similarly, the desert place or the wilderness experience can be the place where the many voices are quieted. All those voices who would tell you who you are, and you've got, we've all got them. 
so that you might have space and peace to discover who you truly are from the God who knows you, from the one who can most completely answer the question, who are you? It's been great to hear that song, I love that song. It's not for now, I've included some thoughts in the Bible study questions that I said that yesterday. It can be a revealing exercise just to identify how many voices are in your grandstand as you play, I guess, the game of life. And recognise what they're saying, whether they're lifting you up or keeping you down. Are they telling you about who you are? For Jesus, there would be other voices wanting to shape his leadership, wanting to steer his priority, to set his agenda. But here in Luke 4, it's a foundational moment. So let's, let's consider these three temptations that Jesus faces. Son of God, great! You don't ever have to go hungry. You don't have to suffer any unsatisfied desire. Turn that state of the bread. Now, what's the tempter's voice really say? What's the sin in the tale? It seems to me that he's saying, man, you're the son of God. With immense creative powers, then use them. Satisfy your every appetite. What could be more important than that? Whatever the appetite, you are made to consume like every other creature. Made to consume. It wouldn't take much to interpret this temptation as the driving force behind much of society, of the individuals that comprise it, of the forces that shape it. <coughs> you are creative, intelligent, educated, energetic, but not satisfied. You are made to consume. And you've been given the powers to accrue that which will feed your appetite. That is your identity. That is who you are, consumer. I'm thinking of a lot of messages that are within our society and our TVs. I love the world out of that. No, you're the consumer. Let us help you do that. Remember Jesus' answer to that? He quoted from Deuteronomy. Jesus said, Man does not live by bread alone. And behind that answer is, is a self affirmation I am more than a consumer. My power is not given me to satisfy my desires. My hunger is very different. My desires are derived from a much higher source. I am more than a consumer. I am a child of God. In your wilderness, there may come a whisper that would seek to diminish who you are, seek to persuade that if you aim low enough, you'll find satisfaction. If you hear nothing else today, hear this. It is so important. You are the much loved child of the most high God. You are the much loved child of the most high God. And you are made for more than bread. The tempter challenged Jesus to turn stone to bread. Jesus turned bread into the symbol of his body, broken for our salvation. You and I were made for worship and for communion and for intimacy and adventure with the Heavenly Father. Don't settle for bread, for being just a consumer. Okay, the tempter comes back a second time. Worthy, you want worthy, I can deliver worthy. You get behind me and things will really happen. You need to realize that in this realm, in front of you, I have power. I can open doors. I can deliver kingdoms, I can deliver glory, you can barely lift the finger. There would be another occasion before Pilate where Jesus would declare, my kingdom is not of this world, and therefore is not obtained by this world's benefits. So no, Jesus would not lift the finger to establish his kingdom. He would stretch out both arms on the cross. Jesus answers the tempter, you're offering a choice between earthly glory or heavenly obedience. I choose heavenly obedience. He quotes again from Deuteronomy, Worship the Lord your God and serve him only. Our wilderness times may well bring this issue into clearer relief. 
Who or what do we worship? What gets our best efforts? What determines our most precious, our most critical values? To whom do we surrender? With whom do we feel most at peace? There are questions worth addressing in our wilderness. Here's a question for now. Does God speak to you? How do you hear his voice? For a few years I was on the Committee for Ministry for our Baptist organisation. We would interview candidates coming through, prospective candidates for a nation. And I'd ask the question, how, how did God speak to you? How come you're here? What did God say that you put me? It wasn't a trick question. Well, I thought it was a trick, it wasn't a trick question. I was just generally interested. Because in front of us was a person or a couple ready to step into a new path and to walk away from a previous direction of life. And so what brought you here? What did God say? How did you hear him? And the typical answer was a combination of spending time in his word, praying, listening to the counsel of trusted Christian friends. Occasionally there were other elements in their answer, sometimes visual prompts. Something God showed me visually. The repetition, I kept hearing the same thing, seeing the same thing. Even music. Let's go speak to you. Isaiah records, your ears will hear a voice behind you saying, this is the way. Walk in it. I have a journal I have found it helpful over the years to record, not every day, but often enough to record my conversations with God. And I was looking back over recent years, back to a time when Michelle and I were deliberating we were in a small church. Is it time to leave? We're enjoying the church, but how do you know? And I've been writing in my journal as I tried to understand what God's voice was saying. I wrote down, It is difficult to pray your will be done. We're both keen to get our teeth into a new project. Lord, speak into our hearts. I was thinking back, I had a lot more energy in those days. Uh, these days we minister in short bursts and then relax. Uh, but I, I expect God to continue to speak to me and to shape me. I feel wrong if at the end of this intro of Ashfield Baptist, I walked away the same person as I arrived. And that is hardly possible, because Jesus is in this place. How can we not be touched, healed, nurtured, being in the presence of God and his people? The tempter has one more round in the barrel. <clears throat> if you are the Son of God, prove to everyone that God is with you. Take a flying leap from this temple tower and the angels will catch you. Now that's a promise from your own script. Now we're not even sure there was an audience who would have been impressed. Maybe the tempter was simply trying to get Jesus to set the agenda for the Father. Prove that God is with you. And Jesus' answer is along the lines, the question is not, is God with me, but am I with him? Not, will he approve my agenda, but will I follow his? Do not put the Lord your God to the test, Jesus' third response, again from Deuteronomy. And it's been noted that all of those three verses that Jesus uses from Deuteronomy come from chapters that refer to the wilderness experience of Israel. It seems that Jesus is drawing parallels between the experience of the ancient people in their wilderness and his own experience in this wilderness. He was one with the people of God. We've talked about wilderness and perhaps this conversation has aroused a desire in you to seek some solitude, but you've got nothing already. A wilderness place, perhaps you detect an aching for meeting with God without the noise of life. Perhaps, which can be more intimidating, you have a desire to know yourself in a true way. I'm not talking about a psychological exercise. I believe that the Bible is written to show us God more clearly and to show us ourselves more clearly. But we sometimes need to be deliberate in shutting the door to the clamours around us. 
Just to reiterate something I said last week, or similar to something I said last week. Henry Newen says that in solitude, our temptation is to do something useful, read something stimulating, think about something interesting, experience something unusual. And I know exactly what he's talking about. It springs from the fear of coming empty-handed. We can find ourselves filling our solitude with our own preoccupations and frequently come away with what we'd already possessed. It's not to say we don't come sometimes or we need to let go of something. A good friends of ours, um, Gary and Jimmy Strachan, some of you might know them, they've been in Canberra for a while now up in Queensland, but when they're in Canberra on their property and they supported those in ministry, they had a labyrinth. Now, a labyrinth is not a maze where you get lost. A labyrinth it's just a place where you walk a path, and you walk a path, and you walk a path, and it kind of helps, it's a bit like solitude, it's a bit like wilderness, because it helps just dispel and centre your mind. I'm going to invite Michelle to come up because we both experienced walking that labyrinth. Um, I'll invite Michelle, which one would you like? The one, yeah, you're the one that's stuck on there. Well, I don't know. It wouldn't be to talk. <laughs> um, Gary and Jenny um, suggested that we walk the labyrinth. Um, the labyrinth, their labyrinth was um, grown, um, had borders of um, lavender. And um, just as I went to walk in, Gary said, You might like to pick something along the way. And I thought, Oh, so I started to walk through the labyrinths and I saw a lovely piece of jagged um, uh, piece of water. So I thought, oh, I'll pick that up. So I picked that up. Now I saw a lovely stone. Oh, I want to pick that one. And I ended up with about six stones and one piece of water. And eventually I reached the centre of the labyrinths. And there they had placed a bird bath. Now, me being a typical pastor's wife, I sort of think of everybody else. And so I thought, well, I can't do anything here, you know, here it is. But the voice came and said, no, this is for you. This is for you. So I had these stones, and I thought, all right, I've got all these stones, what am I going to do with them? And then I decided that I I had been badly hurt in the industry and I held on to that very tightly for a long time. So I took each stone and I decided to name each stone. And they were these people that had hurt me. And I thought, all right, so what am I going to do with the stones now that I've named them? And I thought, the birth bath to me became the heart of God. So what I would do is put each stone in the only place that I could put it, in the heart of God. So each one, as I name them, I put them. I was left with my piece of wood. What was I going to do with my piece of wood? Who was the piece of wood? It was me. So I thought, all right, well, what am I going to do? So I put me in the heart of God. And then I decided I would leave and I would walk out. On the way out, I didn't realise that I'd held on to those stones so tightly, so tightly. And my hand was all full of dirt. And I thought, oh, my need to get rid of the dirt. And the dirt is just all that stuff that hurts. But my hands still hurt from the stones that I've held on to so tightly. And we left from Canberra from, from that experience. We left to come to Sydney. I think that we got to about Campbelltown, and eventually I suddenly realised that my hand wasn't hurting anymore. I had released the stones into God, into His heart. But for the next few days, there was a whiff of lavender. Every so often, there would just be a whiff of lavender 
To me, that was a spirit of God saying, well done. Well done. I've heard Michelle tell that a few times, and I just realise again, sometimes even after you've handed things back to God, there's still some hope. Sometimes things take a while to heal, but it's worth it. In the wilderness, the invitation is to let God do the talking, but the Spirit do the prompting, let Jesus do the healing. You'll know the verse of Isaiah 30, verse 15. In repentance and rest is your salvation, in quietness and trust is your strength. I want to give us just a few moments of silent reflection, uh, just to pray to listen before God, uh, both in this place and those who are watching from somewhere else. Let me share this verse from Zephyr It's one of my favourite, I've shared it before. But just bow your heads and in the silence, listen, speak, be with you. Zephyr 3.17. The Lord your God is with you. He is mighty to save. He will take great delight in you. He will quiet you with his love. He will rejoice over you with singing. Let's be still. I am who you say I am. Well, there are many roles that come to us, some we choose, some a place of us. Many voices that want to tell us who we are. And this morning, our God, we affirm that you are our master, we want to hear our master's voice, our father's voice. He tells us, he reminds us, he affirms us. You are a child of the most high God. I am who you say I am. Thank you for your words to our hearts. Amen. Thank you, Peter and Michelle, for that one. Contribution that God has spoken to us this morning. The band are going to do our last song now, um, a song that um, has, I guess, just as Peter was speaking, reminded me of some of those um, messages that we were looking at earlier on in the year when we were talking about um, people of Israel in the wilderness, the cloud on the fire and being led through the wilderness. We are the followers of God, followers of Jesus. We will follow wherever Jesus calls us to go. I will follow. Thank you. Where you go, I'll go. Where you stay, I'll stay. With you soon, I'll move. I will follow. Benediction, and then um, we're also just going to have a couple of extra council now for uh, dispersal on the premises. So we'll come back to that in the future. But first of all, let me just pray for everybody, including our folks right up there on Zoom. This blessing is for you as it is for people who are in the building with us. The Lord bless you. The Lord make his face to shine upon you. 
and give me to his peace. Tell me his peace this week. Give him thanks to him. God, the Father, Jesus the Son, and to all of us. Amen. Amen. Amen.